Okay, thank you so much, Pat, and uh, welcome to you all. We're so excited to see so many uh, of you participating from what well, I can see across the group uh, at this uh, webinar, uh, which is about exploring the meanings and practices of cultural sensitivity in tourism. So the webinar is based on uh, research and, and activities uh, throughout now two and a half years in the Arctisan project, which is about cultural uh, sensitive tourism in the Arctic, uh, funded by Northern Periphery Arctic Program. Uh, my name is, is Karina Ren. I'm from uh, Aalborg University uh, in Copenhagen, uh, and also the, the, the head of uh, AU Arctic, uh, the Arctic platform of my university. As a researcher, I work with uh, tourism and cultural innovation, uh, and I've been working uh, with cases in, in Greenland and across the, the Arctic. In the, the Arctisan project, uh, I've been in charge of organizing a benchmarking trip that we made to Greenland uh, in 2019, uh, and also with digital capacity building, so that we've been uh, developing with the partners in this uh, project um, an online course for tourism entrepreneurs and students. And of course, also this webinar is a part of that. So starting a conversation around cultural sensitivity in the Arctic, but also uh, across uh, the tourism landscape um, in general. So uh, welcome uh, again. And I'd like to, to give the word uh, in, uh, in the beginning to our two co-hosts, uh, groups, uh, which is uh, Arctisan of, uh, and, uh, and first of all, also uh, Atlas. So uh, Tara, uh, Duncan, I'd like you, if you could say a few words about Atlas to begin with. Thank you. Hi, and thank you very much. Um, thanks to the organizers. This is a really interesting event and I'm looking forward to, to joining in. My name is Tara Duncan. I'm a professor in tourism studies at Dalarna University in uh, Sweden. Uh, we're based about three hours north of Stockholm. Uh, I'm the chair of ATLAS. ATLAS is the Association for Tourism and Leisure Education and Research. We're an organization that's been going for 30 years this year. It's our 30th anniversary. And we are basically a platform for collaboration, for networking, and for uh, interacting between industry, academics, researchers, and students. We have chapters in um, uh, Oceania, uh, Asia, Latin America, Africa, and of course, Europe, uh, and the Middle East. Uh, we have a number of special interest groups uh, ranging from visual methods in tourism, climate change, cultural tourism, event tourism, gastronomy and tourism, uh, dark tourism. So a, a number of specialist groups within. Uh, we're really excited to be able to uh, co-host this event. And this is something we want to try and do more of because we see the links between our members uh, and all of these other interests. So really looking forward to it. Uh, thanks to everybody and uh, looking forward to a really great uh, webinar. I'm going to mute. Thank you, Tara. And thank you for co-hosting this event. And now I'd like to also uh, invite Monica Lucia, who is uh, the PI on the Arctisan project, to say a few words about uh, this project as a starter for our conversation here today. So uh, Monica, uh, if you could uh, tell us a little bit more about Actison, thank you. Okay, thank you, Karina and Randy, please. Will you share my slides? So my name is Monika Lütje and I'm from University of Lapland in Rovaniemi, Finland. And the responsible leader of the Artisan project, just a few words about the project. So we have started in 2018 and the project will go on until uh, autumn this year. And uh, please, Brandy, show the um, next slide. There in the next slide, you see all the logos of the participants. So we, are, uh, we have universities from Finland, Sweden, Norway, and Canada, and then also Denmark, where Karina is. And then uh, we have also um, item museum from Sweden and Northern Norway tourist board from uh, Norway as a, a 
partner and then also Vinta, the Indigenous Tourism Alliance, which has just moved its uh, headquarters from New Zealand to Australia. And then in the next slide, you see our associated partners and they are small and medium sized tourism companies in these uh, countries and also uh, some other organizations, mainly NGOs, but also the Sami parliament in Finland. And um, in addition to the logos you see in the slide, we have also uh, 10 uh, small Sami tourism companies in uh, Norway that are our associated partners. So quite a big group. And our main target group in the project is uh, small and medium sized uh, tourism companies but also uh, others like um, NGOs uh, uh, and uh, public sector uh, stakeholders and all who are connected to tourism development in the Arctic region. And uh, our main uh, purpose of the project is to improve entrepreneurial business environment for culturally sensitive tourism startups and SMEs and uh, the activities we are doing, the first one is to build understanding of culturally sensitive tourism business environment. Cultural sensitivity is a new concept in tourism development and research also. So we have been doing desk studies, interviews and published baseline reports and academic articles and also blog posts a lot about the uh, topic cultural sensitivity. And then what Karina already explained, we have been enhancing skills or capacities. We have created this online course, which is open access and free for everyone. Uh, we are creating a, a digital toolkit for culturally sensitive tourism development. And we are organizing webinars of which this one is the first one right now. And as an, on an international level. And then uh, we are, trying to uh, build a cluster, a culturally sensitive tourism business cluster. And for that purpose, we try to network, which is of course a little bit difficult now because of um, or not the same thing as uh, without the pandemic. We had the benchmarking trip to Greenland and uh, this week on Monday, we had the first online benchmarking trip to Norway. Next, we will have an online benchmarking trip to Finland and then Sweden and uh, um, um, Canada also. Then we are doing product development together and uh, we have uh, created a roadmap to culturally sensitive tourism, which has been published on our website. And then we try to communicate as much as uh, possible in uh, all possible ways. We have been uh, attending a lot, all kinds of conferences, seminars, workshops, and other events, organized events ourselves. We have a quite lively Facebook account and other social media accounts. We have our website, we have uh, blogs, uh, a blog, and uh, also personal communication is very important in our project. And if you want to have uh, more information, then you can please visit our website. And from there you have links to everything we have been creating so far. And I hope you will enjoy this webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica, for giving uh, people here a little bit of background information uh, into the activities of uh, the Artisan Project so far. So now uh, I'd like for us uh, to, uh, to welcome uh, Arvid Wieken, uh, Emily Höckert uh, and Brian Grimwood, who will be talking about the concept of uh, cultural sensitivity in their presentation, engaging with different cultural sensitivity in tourism. So please, if would, you would like uh, to share your presentation, um, thank you. Meanwhile, I was just going to post in, in the chat a link to uh, the online course that Monica was talking about, learnculturaltourism.com. So if you are or know of uh, entrepreneurs in, in tourism or students that might be interested in the course, uh, you can uh, access it uh, or can see there's, there's not a hyperlink, but you can see the, the link to, to the online course here. And we're also just one minute ahead of time. So, uh, so we will give... Uh, we have time for a minute. 
to to get the presenters ready. Uh, yeah, my name is Brian Grimwood. I'm an associate professor at the University of Waterloo in Canada. Uh, the University of Waterloo is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Attawadron's people, and is situated on the Haldeman Track, which is lands promised to the Six Nations of, of the Grand River. Yes, great. And I, I could present myself. My name is Emily Höcke, and I work as a researcher at the University of Lapland in Finland. And uh, I work uh, with the with Arctisen project. And I'm Arvid Viken, I'm working at the University in Tromsø, the Norwegian Arctic University. So we have, uh, we have 10 to 15 minutes um, in this presentation. What we want to do today is, is, is uh, share some work that we've uh, recently had some good news on. We had a, a news from the Annals of Tourism Research uh, yesterday that the, the paper has been accepted for publication. So we're excited about that. Um, and it's work that's based on um, the Arctic Zen project uh, in our, uh, our collaborations with, with that group. Uh, so it's a conceptual paper informed and enriched by the collective efforts, partnerships, and learning among Arctic tourism entrepreneurs, agencies, academics, including various First Nations, Inuit, and Sami, uh, Sami peoples, as well as uh, collaborations with the World Indigenous Tourism Alliance. So our presentation today is meant to offer a brief overview of the conceptual framing of cultural sensitivity in tourism uh, that we developed through this, through this paper. Uh, ultimately, the task is to introduce uh, the group today, um, the 100 or so folks in the audience, uh, to how we've been thinking about cultural sensitivity as a way of enhancing understandings, addressing contemporary challenges, and opening up new possibilities for tourism. So I'll hand things over to Ar uh, Arvid and uh, Pat, if you can flip to the next slide. Okay, thank you. Um, this uh, project uh, basically started in uh, 2016, I think, uh, when uh, uh, we did an uh, application for this Northern Periphery program on something called sustainable tourism. But we didn't come true. And uh, then we had to do a restart and um, uh, try. And actually, we probably came up with a little bit more catchy concept like sensitive tourism. <laughs> Uh, catchy, but maybe, maybe because nobody really knew what it was about. Uh, but anyhow, we got money for that and uh, started the process. Uh, and um, as it probably was said, is it, it is a collaboration between many universities. And then uh, somehow I started together with uh, uh, Emily and uh, Brian on uh, this uh, conceptual uh, paper. And as I almost do when I get, there is a concept I don't know, I start searching around to find, to find out what is said about this concept. And so we did. And, uh, but we should say that at the same time, we also started to talk to people. And actually, it was quite uh, uh, interesting to see how this concept uh, engaged people, although we said we didn't know what it meant, and they didn't quite know what it meant. Uh, we got very good uh, discussion all, uh, around it. And, uh, uh, yeah. and uh, our um, work uh, on the conceptual side, uh, we um, uh, we observed that this was a term that was uh, used in uh, several uh, areas, uh, but it was basically about uh, cross-cultural communication uh, in one way or another. It was used in uh, social work, in, uh, in communication studies, in, in teaching, and so on. And we found one uh, example in uh, tourism related to ecotourism of uh, a guy called Donahoe. Uh, and uh, we also then came across uh, um, 
uh, a work done by one guy called Milton Bennett, who had created a model for stages in development of cultural sensitivity, stretching from ethnocentric to ethno-relative uh, approaches or performances. So uh, that somehow became uh, quite central to what we uh, did uh, after that. So Emily, will you continue? Uh, yes. Uh, so what we have tried to do in our paper is to describe sensitivity as a certain kind of orientation toward others and otherness and difference and kind of a, and, and an orientation to the dynamic nature of cultures. So and just to make clear, we do not we do not approach sensitivity as something being vulnerable or fragile, but we see it as a subjective orientation toward others that is based on recognition, respect, and openness. And our approach or where we kind of our discussion started, um, that they were uh, inspired especially by Emmanuel Levinas' relational ethics. And well, Levinas can also be seen as a post-colonial thinker in a way that he criticizes all kind of categorization of the other and all kind of intentions to essentialize the other, uh, to claim that we know uh, the other or that we know otherness. And, and what he says that instead we should strive for openness. So what we've done, and to be more clear, what we mean, just to try to describe shortly, what we mean by insensitive and sensitive orientations is that we have built on this um, phenomenologically informed model uh, by Milton Bennett, the one that Arvid just mentioned, and his theory of intercultural sensitivity. And what he says that it's not only about skills and knowledge, but he under underlines the importance of self-reflectivity that we reflect our pre-assumptions, cultural norms, and values. And um, well, it's been seen here as an orientation that simultaneously shapes and is shaped by different kinds of narratives and encounters. So it's interesting to think how different kinds of tourism products and services can shape uh, this orientation. So it's not only a prerequisite that we should be sensitive beforehand, but it, there's also the possibility that comes uh, with tourism encounters. So here is our, uh, we, we have tried to put it into this model to be more clear what we're actually trying to say, uh, and also ourselves try to understand what we're trying to say. Um, so we have found this Bennett's model fruitful, especially as it illuminates the differences between ethnocentric and ethnorelative orientations toward otherness. And we have, at the same time, we have developed it further. It's not that we, there are many things which we can read from our paper that it's not that we have just taken his model. We didn't. We saw that it was necessary to adjust it to, to kind of to, to adjust it to tourism context. So we have tested to illustrate our conceptual framework with these two circles. And so to the, on the left circle, on the left side, here, that presents culturally insensitive, these ethnocentric orients. Uh, which were there in Arvid's slide, um, appropriation, assimilation, and stereotyping. And uh, well, this orientation could also be described as this in insensitive, self-centered way of being that creates these uh, categories between me and you, us and them, and so on. And then the right circle presents uh, an ethno-relative realm, in other words, a relational orientation that strives for openness and recognizing and respecting otherness and multiple others and the dynamic nature of cultures. Um, so what do you think it's here is interesting. We don't see it as there will be like stages of becoming more sensitive, but we see it, 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 it's, it's situational and it's interesting what happens in tourism um, encounters and how uh, this kind of respect, recognition, and reciprocity among different kind of actors can be enhanced uh, within tourism. And it's clear that you can, th we have now here these three R's, you, you're, you're welcome to suggest new ones, but the most important is that they still have to start with R because this is our R model. It's a little bit of self-irony there, but you can think of other relational concepts that could also fit here. 
And then can we have the next slide, please? Uh, we, we would like to just provide a few examples what we think that this culturally sensitive orientation could mean in practice. And uh, well, uh, we have the example here from the policy context, um, the Larrakia Declaration from 2012 that promotes the rights and rights of indigenous communities in tourism development which underlines the importance of respect for customary law and law, land and water, traditional knowledge, traditional cultural expressions and cultural heritage. And we have a quote here um, from the late Johnny Edmonds who worked so actively with Binta, with the World, Tourism, World Indigenous, Indigenous Tourism Alliance and was also a key contributor to developing the artisan projects. And what, what Johnny said is that he said he saw that Cultural sensitivity is about respect, that it boils down to respect. We board to Arvid now. Okay, it's probably the next. Take the next, yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Well, these slides show um, the, the Sami costume and uh, the Sami star hat. And um, this it could be used as an illustration of uh, both uh, recognition and uh, respect, actually. What uh, is the major point is that uh, there are so many symbols and meanings into these uh, objects that you should be aware of when you are using it, uh, uh, creating it, uh, uh, selling it, if you should uh, do that. Uh, and um, for instance, the uh, costume will say something about age, about marital status, the place you come from, uh, family, and so on. So there are lots of things to read out of this, which means you have to uh, recognize these aspects to be, uh, to handle it in a sensitive way. That is part of our way we are looking at. Uh, and uh, then uh, it, it, there is a question, of course, who can bear aware of these uh, things? Uh, who can uh, make them? Uh, how can them, they be produced? The, another side of it is that uh, the costume is uh, some sort of a fashion uh, clothing, and uh, which also um, Raises question: How how far can you go with the colors and uh, shapes and everything? Uh, and then, of course, can it be used in a tourism context? And in how? And we have that situation that it is very often used in uh, uh, the costume is used in uh, uh, as some sort of a uniform uh, for people in the tourism business. And um, more uh, in Norway and Finland, I think, than in Sweden. Um, and uh, then the question is, can everybody dealing with tourism in this uh, region wear this costume or should it only be uh, Sami people? And uh, of course, there are uh, not uh, always a very uh, straightforward answer to these questions, but they are, the point is more that you should post this question and, and be aware of it as uh, you are part, when you are part of this uh, tourism context. Uh, and uh, concerning the 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 hat, uh, we ha it is more used in tourism because it's uh, actually a souvenir, and uh, the people are buying it here in Tromsø, and then they are putting it on and uh, walking around in, in the streets. And uh, uh, this is uh, also discussed, if this is uh, something we should defend or should we not, actually. Uh, some think it's disrespectful uh, uh, even to settle uh, this uh, hat. But uh, we, we, in this project, have interviewed one of those selling it, and then he, he felt the dilemma, but had chosen to sell it. As he said, it was a good business because it is so. So um, there are uh, lots of dilemmas, lots of questions to be raised uh, related to sensitivity 
as such, when we deal with uh, some uh, uh, tourism, we uh, uh, have more. Okay, Emily. Yeah, next slide, Pat. And, and we're a, also coming uh, close to, to yeah. the conclusions before yeah. some questions. It's, yeah. it's just it's just me, Karina. So I'll, I'll, um, I'm, I'm the last one to, to speak here. So I'll, I'll try to be as efficient as possible. Um, this this slide here is um, meant to highlight that um, cultural sensitivity operates in and through tourism research as well. And so we're highlighting a project here uh, that I was involved with a couple of graduate students here at the University of Waterloo, Allison Holmes and Lauren King. Uh, as well as the Let's Okay Dene First Nation up in the Northwest Territories. Uh, so the, the citation of the paper is there, but the, the point here is to emphasize that cultural sensitivity as sort of we conceptualize it in, um, as Arvid, Emily and I conceptualize it in the paper is runs through the substance and the process of doing tourism research. And that's highlighted, or it can run through the, the substance and process of doing tourism research. And that's highlighted in this paper with the Let's Okay Dene First Nation. Uh, and then next slide, Pat. <clears throat> uh, and so, so I offer that uh, that paper with um, the Let's Okay Dene First Nation as a as a as a teaser or something to sink your teeth into if you'd like to read more um, on some of this before uh, the paper with Emily Arvid and I uh, comes out. Um, but as as we've been working through this conceptualization of of cultural sensitivity, we found it really challenge, challenging, if not impossible, to pinpoint any sort of concrete definition of what cultural sensitivity is. Uh, both culture and sensitivity are dynamic, contested, and relational concepts. Uh, and so what's become clear to us is that, you know, that this call for cultural sensitivity is not limited to indigenous or and non-indigenous uh, relationships, relationships between indigenous, non-indigenous peoples, or it's not specific to Arctic places, but it's something that has some relevance uh, more broadly within different contexts of different language contexts, different rights, political organizations, influences, economic conditions, and worldviews. Uh, and so our goal with this paper really hasn't been to nail down any sense of uh, what cultural sensitivity is, but to write into the ten tensions around um, cultural sensitivity, provide some uh, conceptual framings for people to think through and to discuss and critique uh, and we hope people will take us up on that on that task. Well, thanks so much. I believe we've got two minutes left for questions. You do. Um, so if we have someone either from the audience, uh, there's a question here from uh, Deborah Insenbacher. Uh, would you like to pose the question yourself, Deborah? Sure, thank you very much for those very insightful uh, comments and congratulations on your paper being accepted in the Annals of Tourism Research, which is a premier journal in tourism studies. So thank you for your model. I think as a community, we can build to improve it. And I want to know about the important word R for responsibility. So your example of the headwear uh, for the Sami people, we can ask this question in relation to um, the selling of cultural uh, clothing uh, worldwide, not just in the Arctic, but if we say who's responsible to maintain the cultural sensitivity in this case, is it the seller or the buyer? Is it both? Um, so I just want to put forward the word uh, responsibility in your model. Thank you. It's a, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. It's, responsibility is a, a, a term that both um, Emily and I hold dear and have, have written about. And I, you know, Emily, I don't know if can you recall the conversations we had around where responsibility fit, drawing on Levinas. Uh, I think we opted to go with uh, reciprocity as, as an alternative um, term that had some resonance with Levinas. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I could think of the responsibilities uh, I don't know if we should have it as we didn't know how to make it with PowerPoint to put it there. No, no, I'm just kidding. We, I think responsibility is, is all over there. I think it would be the responsibility and the responsiveness and the ability to respond. That, that's a very good point. And I think that would be, I think uh, it's part of the sensitive orientation is the, the 
the idea of responsibility. But then if you ask about actors, like whose responsibility it is, that is very good. I'd say that like that everybody <laughs> uh, can, can have their responsibilities in this. I know, Arvid, what would you say? I agree, and that is probably also part of our, uh, our message here, that it is different sides in all these uh, relations, and uh, all have some sort of responsibility to use that term. And then I probably should say that, well, in the next version of the uh, the, the article, the paper, we will in, include the, the responsibility aspects. Thank you. Um, also, uh, Lenya Marquez from what I would like to call our sister project called Sense, Sensitizing Youth, uh, Young Travelers for Local Cultures, has also asked this question, which we will not have time for right now to answer, but which I think we should carry in the back of our mind throughout the webinar, is how we should consider uh, the next steps in terms of developing and strengthening the concept of cultural sensitivity further. Uh, maybe we can come back to that, uh, Lenya. So thank you very much for, for that question as well. But now uh, I'd like uh, for you to, uh, to please welcome uh, Chris Hurst and Harvey Lemmin, who will be uh, uh, giving a presentation exploring cultural sensitivity and indigenous interpretation in Arctic Canada. So Chris and Harvey, if you could uh, share your screen. Oh, that was so smooth. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're good. yeah, I'm here the, for the intros are with Chris. So I'm Harvey Lumlin. I'm in Thunder Bay in the, on the treaty lands of the Robinson Superior Treaty, the Fort William First Nation, the homelands, and also the homeland of the Métis Nation. Uh, Chris will be speaking first, and then I'll come back, and then we'll follow up with some final reflections and then a review. Chris? Uh, yeah, hi. So I'm Chris Hurst. Um, Brian's already done the land acknowledgement for the University of Waterloo, but I'm a PhD candidate there. Um, so yes, our presentation today is about exploring cultural sensitivity and Indigenous interpretation in Arctic Canada. Um, one of the things that uh, we've done is, is take those conceptualizations that Brian was talking about in the last presentation. And as part of the Arcticin research team uh, for Canada, we took a look at how uh, cultural sensitivity has been conceptualized in Canadian literature. So Harvey, if you want to change slides. Uh, we did a systematic literature review, and in that we found six emerging themes, all of which we wrapped up into a uh, definition, although this is open for discussion and debate. We just wanted to put it out there as something that could be considered part of a definition for tourism or for cultural sensitivity in tourism. Um, I'm not gonna read it all out to you, uh, but some of the things that are key coming out of it is it's a personal and professional social disposition about respectful intercultural relationships. It's recognition and respect for different worldviews. It involves ethical practices, protect cultural heritage and promote meaningful interactions. In the Canadian context in particular, we are very concerned about challenging settler colonialism and positively contributing to cultural identity. When we did this literature review, one of the things that kind of came up around it was the fact that every kind of piece of literature that we found or every paper really centered around what cultural sensitivity should look like. And from that, that's where we came up with our themes. Interestingly enough, when we started to think about how that could look on the ground, this is kind of where maybe Indigenous interpretation comes in, because it is around the fact that how can we ensure that the story is being told on lands that are otherwise subject, you know, most cases to Indigenous erasure and have been taken from Indigenous peoples in Canada, how do we ensure that their stories are told in a way that A, promotes cultural sensitivity, and B is able to discuss, you know, what is important to the peoples involved in not taking it from an additional settler colonial as a lens. Harvey, you want to go on the next slide? So what we did is we took a little bit of an approach and tried to do a systematic literature review on indigenous interpretation. And one of the things that we found, again, like cultural sensitivity is there isn't a commonly accepted definition. And we actually found very little on the topic using a variety of key search terms, including things such as heritage, representation, 
indigenous interpretation. We looked at national parks where we know some things are being done. We looked at museums in Canada and we know some things are being done and we weren't finding that in the literature. Another thing that we noticed is that literature that we knew that had been published on this topic matter wasn't coming up in searches. But we do know that it does occur. So this is all very surprising. Harvey, however, has been looking at Indigenous interpretation in terms of his own work. And I'm going to hand it over to you, Harvey, as to what you were finding when you were doing more literature review and hands on the ground. All right. Thank you, Chris. So, yeah, the, the inability of the search engines to find stuff was kind of surprising. Uh, and I know some people are probably getting animated going, well, I know I wrote an article on it. I've ri written several articles on it and Chris didn't find any. So please don't take this as a personal offense. I know that Suzanne de la Barre, de la Barre as most people will know, but it's de la Barre, uh, has written an article on interpretation. There have been books written by Mason on interpretation. There are brand new books written on indigenous interpretation. So this is a serious limitation of interpretation because now that I'm teaching it and I'm certified within interpretation is how will interpreters find any information on indigenous interpretation if they go looking for it, because the search engines aren't finding it. And by the way, we did do the Google Scholar search engine, just in case people want to know that one. This is also surprising considering Canada is in an era of reconciliation. I know that this could be debated, but it's certainly the way the government feels it is. And this is a strategy that was developed by Parks Canada and it's called Fostering a Culture of Reconciliation Within Parks Canada. I won't go through the entire document. I'm just providing you with an overview and interpretation is alluded to in this document. So it's not that Parks Canada doesn't want to do it, but it's how come it's not being applied. And here's an example of where it is being applied, because again, this is not only some of the stuff that I have researched and other people have researched, including Pat Mayer, who was involved in the Torngat research. Uh, Brian Grimwood is attached to the Dene Rangers, the Watchers of the Land, with Lutzel K. The Haida Gwaii Watchman Program is an Indigenous led interpretation program, so guiding. And of course, the Polar Bear Guides in the Torngat Ma Mountain National Park, which I want to point out that with. I have already said that Park, uh, Pat and I wrote several articles on there, and we demonstrated that the polar bear guides, who are all Inuit guides from Nunatsavut, became the key attraction because they are the links and they contain crucial elements, as we are seeing with the Gwai, uh, the Haida Gwai Watchmen, and now the Watchers of the Land in Lutsuke. There's also these phenomenal interpretation center. So Haida Gwaii Heritage Center and the Kluwani National and Reserve Visitor Center and the Daku Cultural Center. And I'm only using examples that I'm aware of and I have visited the one in Kluwani. So it's not only that there's on-site interpretation, there's various definitions of interpretation and you can ask us about it after that. We didn't want to get bogged down too much with that. But what we're trying to demonstrate here is that you both have the formal type of interpretation, face-to-face, -face, and the informal one with these uh, these visitor centers. What we were able to find and throughout my research on this topic, which is, I, I should say is evolving and embryonic. So I wanna, so the terms are similar to cultural sensitivity. And I, by the way, I, I wanna thank Brian and Arvid for springing that article on us because we could have incorporated some of their uh, latest findings, but uh, we're just gonna go with the, the first article that we have. So we have promoting respectful and meaningful intercultural relationships that challenge stereotypes and address settler colonialism. I know that interpretation often says you should not make your visitors uncomfortable. What Pat and I and others I've seen in Torngans is they do in a manner that is very professional, but they also challenge the dominant Canadian narrative that Canada was somehow really nice to Indigenous people, and we have been good to them. Torngats does an amazing job of challenging that narrative. Protecting cultural heritage. Contributing to cultural identity. Again, if I go back to Torngats and Lutzoke 
It's reminding people that this is not an issue of the past, that the people were there, are here, and will be there in the future. It's also in the Torngats, to me, a beautiful demonstration of the multiple generations and the process of healing. What was also stressed in Indigenous interpretation in some of those articles that then show up, but we found offering personal connections to place and multi-sensory experiences. So walking on the land, smelling stuff. I don't know if anyone that's worked with Indigenous people, uh, we call it in dialogical interpretation, which is a new, more qualitative approach to interpretation. We call it heart, head. So you're learning, your heart, your feeling, hands, you're touching. And Indigenous people that uh, and Métis people added hunger for food. And I think that it's a great one because there's always food involved when you work with Indigenous people. And the last one here that we found is fostering a deeper understanding of the sacredness of Indigenous landscapes and seascapes. So now we're getting into challenging worldviews. And sometimes with some for Indigenous people is saying to people, those glaciers are alive to us. Those rivers are living entities to us. So it goes way beyond just providing scientific knowledge of how the river flows. So what's going on here? Well, we know that interpretation parks is a relatively new field and it's largely offered and governed by agencies. What you say, who says it, when they say it. And that often doesn't work very well with indigenous people. National parks, their Canada prides itself like the US does on saying it's one of our greatest assets that we gave to the world, one of our greatest ideas. Well, it's true, but there's a long history of expropriation, of denial of treaty rights, and as Chris mentioned, indigenous erasure. And uh, in Canada, still re there's still a lot of articles saying Aboriginal erasure, so where people so you'll have that acknowledgement that Indigenous people used to be here, but they're no longer here. Well, they're no longer here because they've been expropriated from their traditional lands. Also, that search engines are currently inadequate. And that's important for people that go looking for this information. The reality, however, does mean that if people are looking for this type of information, they're not going to find it. So what we need is, Chris, I believe this is yours. Yes. Um, so further research is required um, to build upon what's there, but also ensuring that the language that we're using and conceptualization, conceptualizations, search terms are actually finding what we need to find. Because this literature, as Harvey said, there is a lot coming out around it. There is a robustness to what is being done. It is concerning that we're not finding it. The second is create an Indigenous interpretation website and a reference warehouse so that we can ensure that we're finding what we need to find and doing so in a way that ensures that Indigenous interpretation is able to uh, work in ways that are actually work, uh, moving towards reconciliation and creating a working definition of interpretation with Indigenous peoples to ensure that what we are saying and what interpretation means it has meaning and is also supportive of cultural identity. So very much inspired, as Chris was saying, from cultural sensitivity. I have a feeling that interpretation with Indigenous people is one of the evolution towards it. I think that storytelling encapsulates more what Indigenous people are talking about. But as we said, we're, this, we're, this is the first phase of a multi-phase project. Thank you. Okay, right on time. Thank you very much, Chris and, and Harvey, for your presentation here. Uh, and we have five minutes for questions, and we might uh, start already with uh, a question from, from Deborah uh, on another R word. So, Deborah, if you would like uh, to, to ask it yourself. Oh, okay. well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that presentation. You know, this is just such a rich area for research and I want to congratulate everybody for 
uh, investigating these pathways. And I hope that by the end of today's uh, event, we can see ways that they all connect to drive this uh, further and get greater value from this summit. I was just thinking about uh, the role of language and translation because uh, my international work has just led me to understand that um, who is doing the translating, who is doing the interpreting, who is running these uh, spaces and exhibitions. You're fading out a little bit, Deborah. If you could get closer to the microphone, please. I'm, I'm on top of the microphone. Uh, I am, uh, is this any better? No. No, sorry. Can't get any closer. Maybe she can write it out, Karina, and we can uh, yeah. address another yes. question. So, so uh, yes, so who is doing the interpretation and who has the right to interpret in a given context? Well, that's a really loaded question. Um, I'm going to take a stab at it. Chris has more experience. I've never worked with Parks Canada. I, I, let's just say I worked against Parks Canada and often <laughs> because I represent Indigenous communities. The narrative is owned and dictated by Parks Canada. There's a new book that came out, Authorized Discourse, and I think that encapsulated it. It is Parks Canada that does the interpretation and says what goes into the interpretation and when the interpretation is done. There's also a rigorous certification process for interpreters which Parks Canada dictates. Chris? Uh, and I think, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I fortunately or not have been on the other side having worked with Parks Canada against Harvey, I guess. No, uh, not at all. Uh, my role was more around policy, but a lot of the conversations, um, especially around things like national heritage sites, around uh, monuments, around even what happens you know in parks there's one thing that goes on kind of at the field unit level where you will start to see that there are certain superintendents who really recognize a lot of the issues around what is being you know officially the script or what makes it onto a plaque and which languages are represented on a plaque um, but at the kind of federal level it's you know and you're you know sitting there in national headquarters a lot of the conversations become around things like um, several parks are located on lands that have traditional territories of both First Nations and Métis and who's at the table and whose story gets told. So they're dealing with a lot of the complexities around negotiating that and the way that Parks Canada has taken that approach largely from my experience is to then determine what is allowed to be said, how it's said and making sure that a certain script is followed. Thank you uh, very much. I, um, yes, I don't know if we have uh, more questions from the audience. I don't see any raised hands. Oh, yes, I see Matt here. Uh, Matt, would you like to ask uh, one last question? Thank you very much indeed. I, I found this absolutely fascinating, um, incredibly interesting. It's a completely new area for me. Um, the question I have is much more global. Um, I teach Arab cultural awareness. And although that is quite a way away from you, the, the clear difficulty I have is that people immediately create barriers when talking about sensitivity, rather than starting with similarities. And is that something that you have found as a, a difficulty when trying to explain to people that essentially we're the same, but our culture, our heritage, our tradition have made us beautifully diverse? Yeah, uh, sorry, it's not that I'm stunned by the question. I, it's amazing that we have to explain that, but yes, it, it is part of interpretation. I think in, in Pat, if I know Pat's not gonna say anything, but I think for Canadians, it's our narrative of our history that's the most challenging. We distinguish ourselves from the US. We didn't have wars, we did have wars with First Nations. We, weren't, we didn't mistreat them the same way. And I think that narrative really is the most challenging because Indigenous people will want to say, like, we are here, but your history is not as good as you think it is. And then you run into this wall with Canadians and it, it, it gets very challenging. Ironically, from what I've seen is Americans are more accepting of that narrative than we are. 
and I'm French Canadian, so I have a different narrative. So yeah, even before we can get to what you were saying is you kind of have to deconstruct with Canadians going, you, you realize your history is not as accurate as you think it is. And I think perhaps to add to that, one of the challenges we also have, I think in a lot of Canadian contexts is because of that narrative and that history and that kind of pushing it to the side, we then have the double issue of pan indigeneity in terms of everybody gets lumped together. So it's everybody um, has the same indigenous history and the same views and the same stories. And in fact, that's not the case either. We have lots of different peoples who, you know, categorically are grouped according to the government, according to Métis, Inuit, and uh, First Nations, but it's a lot more complex than that. And there's a lot more peoples than that. So even to talk about the similarities is, is, is great, but we also have to recognize that because we have this history and because we do put this block up, because it does challenge our own perceptions of Canadianness, that what ends up happening is it becomes Indigenous and they're all the same too, which is also a concern when it comes to interpretation and ensuring that the stories told are specific to the peoples who are involved. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Chris and Harvey, for tending to this question about how we can work maybe around some affinities to bridge uh, differences and then maybe find communalities of, across that. Um, now it's time for just a little bit of stretching, uh, a three minute break. We, we meet again five past, five past a lot of different time zones. Um, get some fluids, uh, raise your hands and arms uh, a little bit, and I will see you five past. Thank you very much. It seemed like uh, two seconds <laughs> of a break. Um, I am very happy now to be able uh, to welcome our partner, uh, the World Indigenous uh, Tourism uh, Alliance, where we today will welcome Aurélie de Lucher. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing this okay, <laughs> Harvey, <laughs> uh, uh, for a presentation on Indigenous Guardians holistic and sensitive uh, approaches as the new ethics in travel experiences. So getting some insights from uh, the, uh, the, the tourism industry side, if you will, but from uh, the perspective of winter. So Aurélie, if I could please get you to unmute and share your uh, presentation with us. Thank you so much. So um, I would like to um, introduce um, the high value and, and incredible decisive role of indigenous people in my own professional and personal path um, and send you uh, later after the presentation a link to a short film uh, which is uh, the trailer of a web series called Guardians uh, that I have created for my own NGO which is called Native Immersion and uh, Native Immersion is aiming at educating travelers before departure to uh, an indigenous destination. Um, the series uh, offer, offers to meet local guardians in Europe who are herders, farm producers, healers, uh, scientists to explore the definition of a guardian, uh, someone that takes care of the land, of the natural world, of local culture, and it's a perspective that was inspired by my work among indigenous community during 15 years. And uh, it tells how um, indigenous people have supported the restoration of my own identity through the connection to my ancestors and my territory. So we send you the link later. And um, we will go back later to that message, but now we will explore deeper um, how indigenous tourism has a key role in a post-COVID world with this central question. Uh, in these times of global consciousness about climate change, uh, why would we still travel for leisure and especially to indigenous communities? So um, who are we targeting in terms of traveler profile in this presentation? Uh, actually, we have to identify uh, types of travelers, the Western travelers, uh, people living in Western countries or with a Western lifestyle, so mainly on a capitalistic model. 
uh, people who have a focus on uh, and with a focus on educated women uh, who feel an attractiveness and growing attractiveness to indigenous cultures and want to live uh, immersive and transformative experiences among communities. Um, and uh, other travel profile are indigenous communities themselves, uh, because travel is not only a purpose of leisure, it's also a mean of cooperation among uh, human communities who are facing the same destiny, uh, crisis, and need for paradigm shift uh, in our relationship to ourselves and the living planet. So first, let's answer the question why why would we travel to indigenous communities um, so first um, is the fact that indigenous people are the world's oldest and best natural protectors and thanks to data now we know that 80 percent of the earth's biodiversity is located on indigenous ancestral lands according to the un um, traditional societies have safeguarded and balanced the, the health of our common home during millenaries. And in a world of huge information flow creating kind of eco anxiety, um, we need to touch and see as a traveler what climate change means to indigenous communities and understand what we can do once back home to support uh, our new indigenous friends. So this kind of experiences are raising the levels of consciousness, of compassion and of global action. Secondly, um, indigenous people remind us all that human beings original nature is to be an earth guardian. Um, native people are first of all, great teachers and educators uh, we should meet to be inspired by their close relationship to Mother Earth, uh, the spiritual and invisible word. It's to learn again the language of the Earth and understand natural and universal laws. Um, the traveler's presence uh, supports the safeguarding of indigenous languages that are at stake. We need to remember that uh, every two weeks a native language disappears um, all languages are precious and accurate. Uh, they are an accurate understanding of the subtle language of the living planet and ecosystems that are passed down from generations to generations and that we need, and that we need now to face the climate challenge. Also, indigenous people have a strong relationship to their ancestry. Um, honoring the elders, passing down oral and ritual traditions it is what have been harmed uh, in Western societies. We need to review and to update the software uh, of our relationship among generations, especially towards the elders who are considered unproductive in our Western societies, according to the anthropologist uh, Tim Ingold. Regarding the spiritual realm, indigenous people have the codes to drive us to the spiritual world in a safe and balanced manner. Humanity now is facing a spiritual crisis, causing a lot of abusive answers to our spiritual impoverishment. And the consequences are a cultural and spiritual appropriation. Uh, the, you, there are many examples that are flourishing throughout the internet, trade and tourism, and indigenous people have the capacity to organize and create a real spiritual code of eth ethics to prevent abusive behaviors um, that we unfortunately meet in the practice of neo-shamanism. Um, travelers can be of great support to protect and acknowledge the, this cultural knowledge uh, that is also creating job opportunities for the youth uh, to relearn their own cultural background. This is a case that I have meet, met um, when I uh, lived a, a six year immersion, immersion uh, in the Atikamek community in Manoan in Quebec, in the Boreal Forest. Then creating new narratives 
um, from recent or for uh, times, we have almost all experienced the vanishing of our cultural specificities. Um, actually, indigenous people are the ones that have lived the most recent waves of colonization and therefore still holding precious part of their cultures. And they are holds in the um, DNA of our modern cultures that call for new narratives on defining local and regional identities. And indigen indigenous people are perfect mediators and interpreters to lead the reconciliation between ancestral and modern world visions. Uh, we, we actually need a conversation between ancient cosmogonies, indigenous and local innovation uh, through artists and creative collaboration to reinvent our history, to also build new maps uh, of the world and deconstruct the mainstream monoculture. Now the question of the how. Um, so, Connected to what my colleagues uh, shared, um, actually a word to indigenous operators, um, a kind of advice, but uh, t telling the real story is, is really the core of, should be the, the core of the strategy. Um, actually, contrary to what is automatically planned uh, on a strategic level, uh, indigenous people should not try, in my view, to fit into the mainstream storytelling standards currently on trend, on trend in the business and marketing sector. Uh, because by doing so, we actually also participate to the stereotype building of our own culture. Uh, I have lived this uh, connected to my own regional culture here, and we see how we also participate uh, in, in uh, when we lose the stories of the land and we lose the stories of our own uh, grandparents, ancestors, and so on, we tend to um, build a fantasy on our own identity and culture. And um, so that's why the advice would be to um, take attention to this and, and don't forget that um, tourism is also a business uh, sector. And uh, we shouldn't forget that it's a culture that we are ready to market and to sell. And we are asked to package our cultural experience. Therefore, we tend to talk more about the activities that we offer rather than believe in the worth of our own identity and story. And there are, uh, in my opinion, other ways to remain authentic without betraying the sacred it's to be ready to offer some level of intimacy. Um, strategically, indigenous operators should take the time to shift and focus, uh, focus uh, the narrative around their own story, like uh, their relationship to the ancestry, to the land, um, the living elders, and offer experiences that also connect to the out of business because this is exactly where the traveler encounters the transformative experience that they uh, are looking for. And your story is what makes you absolutely unique and definitely, definitively human. Um, so the advice would be to uh, be divergent and bring, uh, bring the indigenous worldview things to your artists. build a strong and ethical system and prepare the travelers. So as was, it was previously said, um, to prevent cultural appropriation and spiritual abuse, uh, indigenous operators and their community must, must build a strong ethical system uh, as a shield to abusive attempt to the sacred practice, items, spaces, and beliefs. Um, this is what we are trying to do with Native Immersion uh, in, in offering that service as an add-on to travel agencies, is to help prepare, guide, and follow the traveler before, during, and after the immersive experience among Indigenous communities to participate to the respect of Indigenous rights, uh, intellectual and spiritual property with the preparation uh, of Indigenous educators. A remarkable example uh, that I have lived myself is when entering Aotearoa, New Zealand, 
the Maori people straight away talk to the visitors with Maori word. Um, so they immediately uh, teach you the word vision and prepare you to shift your mind and spirit to Aotearoa. Um, then, to conclude, okay. yes, thank um, you. <laughs> it appears that we have now entered the era of the guardians and the world is taking consciousness of the key role of indigenous people to sustain life on earth. Um, this is exactly where indigenous people can promote themselves in a humble and ethical way to offer a journey back to the roots of humanity. Uh, that travelers in a quest of meaning tend to look for. And the benefits are both sides to use the tool of tourism as a transformative experience uh, of mutual understanding, uh, mutual healing and cooperation. So to go further, I have prepared some links I'm going to share um, with you right after the question and answers, if you have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Aurélie, for this um, um, beautiful presentation. Uh, I am sure there are lots of questions, um, but we only for now have uh, time for, for just uh, one. Um, so if there is someone uh, who has a question, they can indicate it in the chat, um, just with a cue or something, or um, let me know if there are any questions. Oh, there are the links. Um, well, it seems that there's not. So I have, uh, I have one uh, for you, which I'm very curious in, 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 um, in, in having your answer to, which is how do you, how do you in winter work with uh, some of these, uh, um, these ideas? How can you give a, a, um, a specific example as to how you work with this concept of uh, of guardians in in your own work. Actually, the the concept of of guardians was um, I, I used to talk uh, with Johnny Edmonds, uh, who was our director in Winter, and and we um, we explored together the notion of of guardianship because. Um, it came a couple of years ago as a, an obvious uh, nature of, of indigenous people, an obvious role that indigenous, indigenous people had in protecting um, lands and um, natural uh, wonders that were uh, a part of the common heritage. And um, now the idea was to turn this uh, nature into something uh, that could be taught to the travel industry. And that's, that's why through a native immersion, uh, we, we tried an attempt to, um, to create that add-on to the, the travel agencies and, and uh, take um, actually the, the lead to uh, prepare the travelers and the travel agencies to make sure that the experience uh, they are selling uh, uh, respect indigenous standards and respect indigenous rights, and that uh, we can select indigenous educators who can prepare with us, uh, who are, uh, for example, myself, I'm not indigenous, but uh, I can, I would say, um, do some um, cultural translation with uh, an indigenous educator, and together we work to uh, we work to prepare travelers uh, who want to live an immersive experience in indigenous uh, communities. And by preparing, we did that with um, um, tra Western travelers who wanted to to go to um, an immersive experience among a Maasai um, village. And we prepared them to, to know how to uh, use their camera, how to, uh, you know, um, just get the basic respect and understand the protocols of the community before going. But the teaching is during the whole, um, du during the whole experience and even after, because when people uh, are living uh, a cultural shock, 
they also need to have a like a psychological um, support to understand how they can turn their uh, experience connected to indigenous people into something productive once they are back home. It means that they are going to work to uh, go some go to do some research uh, on their own ancestry uh, and uh, get maybe more involved in protecting their own territory. And that works. Yes, thank you so much. And now I see lots of questions popping up, but I'm sorry to say that we will not have time for them here. Maybe you can post them directly to already uh, or to all of us uh, in, in the chat. That would be great. Um, sure. I uh, thank you. Um, now, I'm, uh, as I was saying before, uh, Actison has been going on for two and a half years, which means that we uh, have been going on in the middle of what we're all living with now, uh, namely uh, uh, the pandemic and also the repercussions that that has had uh, for the tourism industry ac across the globe, uh, but also uh, profoundly in, uh, in the Arctic. Um, and to try to understand how... Um, how within uh, the area uh, that is covered by Actis and how this has impacted some of the, the small uh, businesses and entrepreneurs that we are working with, we were so lucky to be able to engage uh, Elspeth uh, Bimbom and Randy Bruin, uh, our very uh, dynamic duo from the Netherlands, uh, to explore uh, the intricacies of this. So I'm really looking forward to to uh, to sharing. Uh, your or for you to share your presentation on, on what uh, uh, the pandemic has meant for uh, tourism entrepreneurs in the Nordic Arctic. And um, Elspeth and Renny, if you could please share your presentation. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you very much, Karina. Um, yes, so hello everyone. Um, so as Karina already mentioned, uh, Elspeth and I are both assistants at the Artisan project, and um, we, uh, yeah, to, in the last half year, we conducted interviews to uh, explore, uh, yeah, with tourism entrepreneurs and DMOs in the Nordic Arctic to explore pandemic impacts on culturally sensitive encounters in this uh, area. Um, yeah, so uh, you can follow our progress uh, on the bar uh, and we will first give a little introduction and then uh, describe the Arctic tourism landscapes uh, and the changes uh, they went to that we found uh, due to COVID-19. Then we will uh, describe the, the new and different encounter that took place to these, due to these changes. And here, Elspeth will jump in. And then we will conclude on our preliminary findings. So, um, yeah, since the pandemic, the, the, yeah, tourism, the UN World Tourism Organization states that uh, tourism reached a level as low as uh, 30 years ago. So as you can see, a massive drop in uh, terms of tourism. Um, as international travel, travel came, to, came nearly to a full stop, uh, local, regional and domestic tourism actually uh, did an impressive comeback. Um, but then the questions, question arises, uh, yeah, what does this new form of tourism actually uh, has for impact on the encounters between Arctic hosts and guests? and how to engage with differences within national borders. Uh, yeah, so first we will uh, uh, yeah, discuss the, the Arctic tourism landscapes and the changes that, uh, that it went through uh, due to COVID-19 that we found, of course. Um, so most, uh, most importantly, throughout the Arctic, we, uh, um, it's, it seems that domestic visitors are much less inclined to book guided tours or cultural experiences, such as uh, Sami experiences. So um, as one Norwegian tourism entrepreneur told us, the, the domestic tourists here are not so into guided trips. Uh, they would like to experience uh, 
only small parts of the full tours, actually, the full experiences that they provided. So um, tourism companies were then uh, advised to actually unpackage their tours. And for example, so that domestic tours could choose for a reindeer meet and greet only instead of the full reindeer experience. But what do these changes actually say about the encounter and host guest relationships? So in case of Sami tourism, several DMOs mentioned that the encounter between a Norwegian, Swede, or Finn with a Sami host could be a bit awkward. And then they advise the, the tourism entrepreneurs to be less explicit in representing their culture or use other ways. And even though they didn't receive many guests, the entrepreneurs shared examples of how it was easier and more personal to host domestic guests because they share the same language, common stories about, for example, uh, national politics, but also their relationship to nature. But this sameness also led to uh, new conversations and ways of relating to each other. For instance, uh, one of the Sami entrepreneurs shared that domestic guests um, uh, yeah, received it to be challenging when she used the word nature as cultural element and very important part of her Sami identity. And then she described that domestic guests responded with, uh, to emphasizing their own good relationship with nature. Yes, uh, and then the next question is, um, how do these domestic encounters impact cultural exchange between the host and guest? Um, so even though most of the respondents uh, looked back on warm encounters, positive encounters uh, with the domestic guests, there was also a tendency among Sami entrepreneurs uh, to move their cultural identity more to the background. Um, for instance, uh, a couple of entrepreneurs mentioned that they uh, do not start talking about their Sami heritage themselves uh, unless their visitors would ask them because they don't want to be uh, confronted with stereotypes they might have of Sami people. Um, and another uh, entrepreneur who offers nature retreats uh, focused now more on mindfulness uh, instead of Sami spirituality as she initially did in her storytelling. Um, so as a consequence, uh, cultural exchange and having new dialogues with uh, domestic guests become a matter of cultural sensitivity. Um, because many uh, entrepreneurs first await and or evaluate uh, the personality, the attitude and the, the openness of the domestic guests uh, towards Sami stories. Um, so they wonder, are these guests interested and receptive towards difference? Um, so depending on the level of intimacy and personal, um, personal connection there is between the host and guest, uh, personal stories are shared in a safe and trusted environment. So as one entrepreneur uh, also described, as you can see in the slide there, um, telling stories about his beliefs to outsiders or tourists um, makes him actually feel quite vulnerable because it is different. Um, so an intimate personal relationship must be uh, established first um, before cultural can exchange can happen in a culturally sensitive way. Um, so finally, uh, when speaking of Sami tourism in a domestic context, um, there are new and different ways of uh, engaging with difference uh, that actually go beyond self other and same different binaries. Uh, the pandemic impacts have opened up for new conversations where both similarities, for instance, uh, the close connection to nature, uh, and also differences like the different ways of relating to nature are explored between Sami hosts and domestic guests. Um, also the way of approaching uh, domestic visitors um, and disseminating Sami stories uh, has changed in comparison to the encounter with international guests. Um, whereas Sami culture usually is uh, the core of the experience, or often is. So instead, uh, now, domestic tourists seem to be approached on the premises of personal interaction based on culturally sensitive values of both the, uh, both the hosts and the guests. Um, so considering these findings, uh, we can actually ask many new questions. 
uh, like how do these tourism developments compare to destinations within the Arctic and beyond? Uh, what lessons can we draw from these experiences? Uh, and also how will this comeback of domestic tourism develop in post pandemic times? Um, yeah, so all these questions bring us to, uh, to the end of our talk. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you um, so much, Randy and Elspeth, for, for sharing uh, this uh, new research um, and, and seeing how um, the, the pandemic has, of course, created uh, grief and, and big challenges, but also offering new ways uh, to restart uh, or begin or initiate uh, new conversations. And I think that also ties back to some maybe questions before, like how do we work with, with crafting new affinities across uh, uh, perceived differences? So I think uh, that that is, uh, oh, sorry, this is really interesting. Um, now I am going to give uh, the word uh, to myself as well uh, as to, uh, to Brit Kambi. Um, so uh, we've been having a, a conversation with ourselves, if you will, within uh, Within, uh, within Artisan Project. And uh, it's always very good to also get some views from the outside, if you will. And, um, and so uh, I've been lucky to be able to uh, invite Brit Kambi, who is a professor at the Arctic University of Norway into a conversation uh, about the avenues or the perspectives on future research in, but also sort of in the corners and, and around tourism. So Britt Kami uh, is from the Department of Tourism and Northern Studies uh, at, um, at uh, the Arctic University of Norway and, and has worked uh, a lot with indigenous and Sami ways um, of knowing. So what's, what's been interesting uh, with Arctisan is that uh, throughout these years now, we've been able to work um, across uh, the Arctic, not working as has been the case uh, 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 before, uh, sort of case-based, um, but to actually try to 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 um, to learn and to think uh, across the Arctic, uh, and as a, as a part of that, we were, we were lucky. Some of us, uh, Emily and I, to take part in this um, uh, this uh, writing of an article for the Scandinavian Journal of Hospitality and Tourism to celebrate their 20th anniversary, where we took some of the insights from Arctisan uh, in conversation with other researchers who have worked with uh, Arctic culture and indigenous culture in the Nordic Arctic, and to try to, to uh, look across um, some of, of, um, of uh, the destinations there. And so what we could see looking into this was that um, the representations of uh, local and indigenous cultures uh, took on many different meanings and different shapes across the Nordic Arctic. And something we're beginning to see, I think, throughout these presentations today, that there is not uh, one uh, result um, or one conclusion uh, coming from tourism. That tourism is entangled in many different ways with uh, different uh, communities and with different uh, issues of identity and culture and, and so on. Um, and we could also see, I think, very clearly from Aurelie's presentation is how tourism can work both in ways that can uh, uh, essentialize and stereotype uh, local uh, communities uh, and indigenous cultures, but also uh, reversely work in other situations and other contexts to actually support and strengthen these, uh, these cultures and, and work with uh, reactivating uh, or reinterpreting a heritage and, and traditions. And, and what's interesting is that that mirrors kind of a general uh, um, view in, in tourism research of how tourism uh, can both be empowering but also destructive uh, when we look at local cultures. Um, and so um, that brought us to a discussion, Brit and I, uh, and also others, that, that how do we, um, how is, is the way that we research and the way that we conceptualize tourism not an innocent endeavor? How is it, uh, in the case of the Arctic, not only a problem about identity politics, so who, uh, who has ownership, who, uh, who has rights, uh, who, uh, who can claim uh, to produce or to represent culture in an authentic or in a correct way, but it's also actually a part of ontological politics. So really asking questions about uh, what tourism is or should be in the Arctic. 
what are the aims uh, for tourism. And if we look across the Arctic, we can see that in some areas, tourism is a, a tool for uh, for uh, capitalistic profit. It's also in some parts uh, a tool for regional or even national development uh, towards independence, uh, towards local capacity building, but also towards healing and empowerment. So there are many different ways in which tourism plays a role. And the way that we as researchers uh, sort of uh, uh, engage ourselves into this, how we document uh, tourism is not just this um, innocent endeavor that we are concern, uh, we are entangled in the way that we pose questions and research uh, with communities, businesses and, and government programs uh, or intergovernment programs such as the one of Artisan. And so the question is, um, when, when we do engage in these kinds of uh, research uh, projects and when we are uh, asked to co-produce knowledge, um, what is our responsibility? So coming back to, to one of these R's that have been addressed uh, today. And how can we as researchers uh, walk into spaces of co-creation? And how can we increasingly take in indigenous ways of knowing uh, seriously in, in, in those activities? How can we rethink our roles, our positions, and the effects uh, of research uh, in, uh, into this? Um, and so this is what I'd like uh, to, to, uh, to invite Britt to say something about, um, to uh, share some of her insights from, from uh, research uh, and also to be able to, to have a conversation around that. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, <clears throat> it's wonderful to be with you here today. And I think that what you are talking about now is, is really inspiring and really uh, important. Uh, and uh, I want to, to, to talk today uh, from this uh, project that I work on called uh, Okta, Art and Community of Friction in Sápmi, where we are focusing on Sámi festivals. Uh, Okta is this wonderful Sami word that means one and many at the same time. Uh, and, and that goes in a sense with what we wanted to do in, in this project, because the project is, uh, is uh, on the one hand, uh, it's inspired by Eva York, that was a, a, a well-known Sami artist. And he said that the do a Sami dialogue always take place gathering around the Aram, gathering around the fireplace. So, so that has inspired the way that we work. Um, in addition to that, uh, we wanted uh, to investigate it, if some of the Sami concepts uh, could be used as analytical tools. So not uh, only are the Sami language, one of the languages that we as a group work with, because uh, we have research partner from from Finland, from uh, Denmark, from Norway, and we have also um, the Sami Council, uh, Christina Hatta, as a, as a full partner uh, in the project. So there are several uh, in the group of researchers that speak Sami. So we could use Sami as a working language, both when we gather around the uh, Aran, but also uh, within uh, our own publication, and uh, the first publication will be out soon. Uh, uh, we use this concept of um, doima, that is uh, community, because this is about communities. Huh? But Sarvadoigma is not it's not the community. It is this concept that uh, Sami concept that relates to the making of a community and how community kind of are something that are performed together. It's not there, you are making it uh, when you kind of maybe also enter in, into this kind of uh, gathering around um, around the uh, uh, around. So, uh, so what we are also trying to do uh, is to take inspiration from, you know, this kind of, not only do we consider 
sensitivity as an important concept, we also think that we need kind of to work within the boundaries of respect, uh, responsibility that already had been mentioned, reciprocity, uh, interrelationness, um, and, and kind of work out what this principle will mean, you know, also in different kind of contexts. So what we have done is that we have arranged this public knowledge uh, dialogue at the different festivals, um, which is kind of taking place in the open space where we invite some other scholars, we invite artists, uh, but also everybody can participate because it's open. It's an open space. So we don't do kind of, uh, you know, uh, we don't do uh, one by one interviews or so on. We kind of trying to create ourselves this side of the dogma in order for, for all that want to engage with the kind of question that we kind of want to, uh, to investigate so they can participate. Uh, and often, like here, um, uh, we, have, we are also on the program, so to speak. Uh, it means that it is is an is an open space for for every uh, for everybody uh, to uh, to enter. So in these kind of groups, these are two different festivals. You know, we use this kind of event uh, to uh, to also, in a sense, uh, to engage with the idea that knowledge is something that we do together. Knowledge is something that become you know, uh, through this kind of engagement with each other and, and where we also try to make symmetry between the different knowledge holders. So we kind of regard, uh, you know, uh, our member of, of the group from, from um, the Sami Council, she's also a co-writer because she is so much, uh, she's so important for us and she's kind of producing knowledge together with us as so are many of these other that you see here. So maybe you can shift Karina. So I, I think that, uh, you know, in a sense, um, when we think about uh, co-creation, uh, how should we think about co-creation Karina? Yeah, so, so this is something that we've been spending some time uh, to discuss. Uh, how are we as tourism researchers also implicated in uh, sensitizing ourselves and sensitizing our research uh, methods for different and other ways of knowing? Um, mm -hmm. And, and I hear I know that you we, we, we discussed like how is it possible to engage with these local challenges of the communities and how do mm -hmm. we also need to do this uh, in an earlier stage of research, and I know you had some really good, uh, some good examples as to how we could do this. Yeah, what we have learned, and you will, <clears throat> you will also find a blog at uh, at the web page of the Sami Council that relate to this. You know, the art of listening as a kind of concept, which is very important. Uh, the art of uh, listening is kind of. Uh, uh, to to have this early involvement before the research proposal are set. Uh, <laughs> I'm so sorry, I have to just close it down. You can go on, Karina. Yes. Okay. So uh, so thank you. Well, basically, you can see in this is this last um, this last slide some propositions as to how we can sensitize uh, ourselves to listening, as Britt was saying, in new ways. Uh, giving time, starting earlier, uh, yeah. use time to learn and to uh, embed our projects in community concerns and uh, engaging also in communities of local experts. Uh, so actually starting uh, to research, to listen, to find time and, and to learn uh, together in, in new ways is also a way by which we can sensitize research as I think quite uh, an important um, partner in knowing about tourism in uh, in new ways. Yeah, and, and I think that you need to kind of evolve the communities in a very early stage. 
you know, to think about also financial support as a well this, as this kind of time frame in order to prepare the concept, you know, to, to have the time to kind of really embed it and to build a kind of research group, uh, you know, not only with indigenous institution, but also with, um, you know, it could be indigenous scholar or students uh, or, you know, kind of be able to listen also through uh, maybe indigenous languages is if some prefer that, you know, and that has to do with with respect and 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 symmetry uh, as a methodological and theoretical uh, tool, I think. Yes, and and I have to say that I. I also agree with you, uh, and I think that we are coming, I wouldn't say full circle, because I think that this isn't something that we get uh, a proper view upon, but I can see that we are getting back to some of the ideas also proposed in, in the first presentation, some mm. of this, uh, mm. um, the respect um, um, and listening. Um, mm. I don't know, I mean, now I'm kind of asking people to ask us questions, <laughs> um, but we still have a, a few um, minutes uh, before we, we finalize. Um, mm -hmm. So I wonder if perhaps there are others that would like either to ask questions, but also maybe um, to share some thoughts uh, or to come with other comments uh, into, uh, into this. Um, does it resonate with where you are? I mean, you're all sitting, uh, across the globe almost. Um, I know you'll have questions in a minute, so it's now you have to do it. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, if, if anybody, uh, it seems like no question is coming up here. Uh, you know, I think what we, what we could do is kind of to, to also be concerned with map. And, and kind of learn about what is already ongoing, you know, because like in in uh, in in Sapmi, as in many other indigenous territories, you know, there are there are quite a lot of different, you know, cultural center, knowledge center, uh, local museums that are in need of support financially, that are also in need of support when it comes to human resources. So how can your project, if you want to do a project, engage with those needs? Huh? And, and how can, um, uh, you know, and how can your research projects support what is already important for the community? And, and also to think about how we can kind of return the research results in a way that will be helpful for the community and maybe also help implement those results. Camilla, uh, I will ask you now. Uh, you won't be cheated this time. Corino, did you address me? Yes, I did address you. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I I don't know if the hand uh, function works actually because when I I press yeah, but anyway, so uh, thank you so much, and I really enjoyed the the conversation you had, and I actually wanted to go back to the presentation by Randy and Elspeth and and ask also you to reflect on what they raised actually the the kind of the difficulty in negotiating the sensitivities between. Well, in, in Sami tourism with the, the guest or visitor who is actually very close culturally to their own culture, mm -hmm. uh, maybe you could call it a kind of hybrid uh, tourist or, or maybe some of those tourists are Sami themselves. So, so do you have any reflections on that? Thanks. Uh, yes, you mean us, right? Randy or me? Yes or not? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, some of the entrepreneurs, um, they also mentioned actually that um, some of the Sami tourists, for example, they also had to be sensitive towards difference within these Sami communities because, yeah, as, as you also know, there are so many different ways of being Sami. Some folks on the reindeer and, and some have a completely different take on it. So also within... Um, Sami host guest relationships, uh, 
there actually, there's actually also difference that they have to be sensitive of. And Brit Camilla is also asking us to, to reflect uh, on that. I'll, I'll leave that uh, to you. <laughs> I'm not really sure what you mean by that question, but I think that what is happening at the moment, uh, Camilla, is that quite a few of the tourist operators that I know of are um, uh, kind of rebuilding their products, uh, you know, in order to offer them to a, to a different uh, market, a market that could you could say would more close. I don't like the concept of hybrid but but kind of offer um, uh, and it means that they want the guests to stay longer it means that they maybe they uh, dig deeper uh, into kind of different ways of knowing that you know they have the possibility to engage with food and en engage with you know many different kind of practices and and of course now I'm in particular thinking about you know, we have a uh, we have a mentor uh, that is hired at uh, our program, Elinor Utsi from Davisida, that participate in the most of our projects and uh, and also uh, take part in educating our students. And she's one of those that have been highlighted. This kind of you know this kind of new way that you need to to uh, to kind of make your products in a sense a cultural ticker i would say you know kind of it's 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 more um, uh, you want this, the people to stay longer and then you have to offer them kind of uh, in a sense more and and, uh, and more intimate knowledge and and through that you know you also you also kind of uh, maybe have to uh, also that some are kind of rebuilt in a sense the company as such uh, in order for this to happen because uh, you know this kind of uh, tourism was uh, you know growing so fast uh, at the, in these last years and in this this like really expanding uh, tourism I think many have uh, Built products and 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 haven't really had the time to think it through, but during the Corona, you know, they have had the kind of possibility to step back and and think through and and maybe think again and kind of make instead of offer something that uh, that is also maybe partly more valuable for them to offer. That has to do more with cultural competence. Time is running now, and uh, I believe we could continue this conversation for a long time. I appreciate how uh, rights and respect have been discussed here, and also the sharing of the real everyday stories, new narratives, also tying into what we call product innovation, uh, and how also the art of listening uh, mm -hmm. is, is important here. So it, it ties into all areas of tourism, tourism research, culture in a broader sense and how we develop uh, the places that we live in and that we visit. So thank you so much all for uh, listening in, for presenting your work and your thoughts and for uh, yeah, providing us with, with, the, with, the, with comments and your time. Thank you so much and um, uh, now I'd like to give the final word to, to Pat and uh, wish you all a, a lovely evening or morning or night, wherever you are. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Karina. So I, I have the last word here. And, and again, I will, I will echo what Karina has said. Thank you to all our uh, presenters. Thank you to all of you who attended. Thank you to our excellent timekeeper again. Thank you, Karina. Um, at least as good a job as, as Edward did two weeks ago. Um, now what we would like to do um, is we, we will stop the recording now uh, and we will welcome folks to stick around. If